What's up, everybody? How's the 1045 service doing? Caffeinated? Ready to go? Let's welcome all those watching online. Everyone, put your hands together for those that are joining us online. So glad to have you. Hey, I want to echo what Pastor Scott said about First Wednesday. Man, it is so powerful, especially the last one was so cool just to get together. And there's something special about First Wednesday. Every time I walk in, I, I feel this. It's just you can feel the faith in the room. It's almost like you can cut it with a knife, and it's so powerful. And God always responds to faith. So I want to encourage you, come out, be a part of it. It's going to be awesome and a lot of fun. Well, hey, we're going to continue our series in Matthew. If you've been with us, you know that we've been looking at the first book in the New Testament, written by the guy by the name of Matthew. He was a tax collector, and before he came to Jesus, he um, was in that career and did it for the Romans, which was not fun for him because he was a Jew, and the Jews didn't like the Romans, so it put him in a bad spot. So they, he was kind of an outcast. But then Jesus calls him to come follow him. And so he gives up his tax collecting, and he goes to follow Jesus, becomes one of his disciples. And as a part of his life work, he writes the Gospel of Matthew. It specifically hones in on the last three years of Jesus' life, specifically his ministry. And what's really cool about it is not only does Jesus change and transform his life, but the very people that kind of disowned him, now he's serving them, the Jewish people, because he's writing specifically uh, for them to help them understand that Jesus is the Messiah, that he was the one that was prophesied about in the Old Testament to come be their savior, not only the savior of the Jewish people, but all the whole world. And, and he, was, he, writ, he wrote that to the Jewish people so that he could serve them, care for them. And so as you read the book of Matthew, you'll see that he quotes the Old Testament a lot. And it's also very cool to see that as an outsider, kind of how he frames up so many of the stories. So we come to Matthew chapter 7, which is the Sermon on the Mount. We're almost done with it. Pastor Scott's going to finish the Sermon on the Mount next week. And so we come to Matthew chapter 7. And um, I'm, I titled today's message this, there's one way, there's just one way to life. There's just one way to life. Let me ask you guys, have you ever, um, you, you, you're probably aware of the story, the legend of the, the fountain of youth. Have you heard of this? You know, it's like the, the spring that you want to drink from so that you look younger and you can live forever. And, and I wanted to learn a little bit more about this uh, fountain of, of youth. And so I went to my friend, ChatGPT. Have you guys heard of this? Have you guys ever experimented with this? It's super fun, okay? So I just went to it, and I asked it the, the, this question here. I asked it, is the story of the fountain of, of youth true? Just to have fun. And this is what it gave back to me. It's like this AI machine, okay? And this is what it gave back to me, okay? The story of the fountain of youth is a legend that has been passed down through the ages, there is no historical evidence to suggest that a fountain actually exists and is generally considered to be a myth or a fable. The legend of the fountain of youth is believed to have a originated in ancient Greece and Roman mythology, where there were stories of magical springs and rivers that had power to bestow eternal youth and life. Over time, the legend of the fountain of youth had been retold and adopted in various cultures around the world with different versions of the story featuring different locations and magical powers. While the fountain of youth may not be a real place, the idea of eternal youth and immortality has fascinated humans throughout history. Like literally it produced this in like a matter of seconds. Then it goes on to say, many people have pursued various methods and treatments in an attempt to prolong their lives and maintain their youthful appearance. Kind of like me, obviously. However, aging and death are natural processes that cannot be avoided entirely. And it is important to focus on living a healthy and fulfilling life rather than seeking mythical fountain of youth. Interesting. Some wisdom. Spitting some wisdom there. So I just thought, while I'm at ChatGPT, I thought I'd ask you another question. And I said, hey, can I be healed of my balding? I just thought, hey, I would just ask it while I'm there to see what it would say. So it, it gave me back, I can take medication. I can get surgery, I can get uh, laser therapy, I can actually get a tattoo that I put on my head, or I could get a hairpiece. Now I want to ask you guys, if I came back next week with a full head of hair, hairpiece, would you judge me? Would you judge me? Would you, would you, would you slightly smile as I did announcements? 
You would. You would. Well, I'm not going to do that. It did tell me that I do need to consult a healthcare professional before getting a hairpiece. So I'll make sure that I do that. Well, here, the, reason, the whole reason I looked up that thing is because here's what we're all seeking. We're, we're all seeking this idea of life. You know, we want more life. Whether you de- define that as, you know, a peace and joy and fulfillment, we're all chasing that in some form or another. And the Bible talks about this. You would, you would say that life is, is done in a fulfilling life in a relationship with God. It's when I have a relationship with the creator, that's how I can experience life. And the passage that we come to today actually tells us where we can find this life that I believe that all of us are actually chasing. Okay, so Matthew chapter 7, we're going to pick it up in verse 13. This is what it says. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. And many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life. And only a few find it. Watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. But they're but you will recognize them by their fruit. Do people pick grapes and thorn from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, and every bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evil doers. So kind of a light, encouraging message today. <laughs> we're just gonna, you know, be all be encouraged together. <laughs> so, all right, so Jesus, we're gonna unpack this. Jesus is talking about two ways, okay? He's talking about two groups, and he's talking about two outcomes. You've got the broad or wide path, and then you've got the narrow path. You've got the majority, and then you've got the few. You've got the destruction outcome, and then you've got the life outcome. So obviously the the question is what Jesus is, is talking about. Well, how do I get to the life? Like that's what we're all after whether you're on the broad or on the narrow path, I bet everybody that's going down life is trying to find life, this idea of fulfillment and satisfaction, peace and joy. All the, they're all looking for it, but only a few actually get there. And it's at the what I'm going to call the narrow gate. So it's the narrow path or the small gate, but we'll just call it the narrow gate. Okay, so where is this narrow gate that Jesus talks about? What, who is it? What is it? Well, we find if you go to the Gospel of John, Jesus actually talks about this, clarifies what the gate is. Certainly it's inferred in the passage here in Matthew, but we can get real clarity in John chapter 10, verses 7 through 9. It says this, Therefore Jesus said again, very truly I tell you, I am the gate. Everybody say that with me. I am the gate for the sheep, and all who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. Okay, so here's the first point. If you're taking notes, this is the first point. Jesus is the gate that leads to life. Jesus is the gate that leads to life. This is really important to recognize that it's only found in Jesus that you can find life. It's not actually found somewhere else. I mean, you could have a temporary feeling of satisfaction, fulfillment, joy, but ultimate eternal life is only found in Jesus. In fact, he clarifies this in another place in John chapter 14 talking about how he's exclusive. Like he's saying like, hey, it's only found through me. This is what he says. Jesus told them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Notice it's not a way, a truth, a life. You know, it's it's the, it's definitive. It's the way, the truth, the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. I know this might seem like a simple truth, But the truth is that life is only found in Jesus. And the only way that you and I can get to the Father and have a relationship with God and ultimately find satisfaction, fulfillment, and life is found through Jesus. He is the narrow gate. He's the one that leads to life. It's not found in anyone else or anywhere else. It's only found 
in Jesus. And how we receive that, right, is by faith. It's by making him Lord of our life. It's where we abandon our old way of life and we take up our life with Christ. It's where we say, I'm not going to be king of my heart anymore, right? It's where we say, I'm going to make Jesus king of my heart and life. I'm going to make him Lord. That's why the Bible says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That's how we receive salvation. Now you think about this, you know, you've got the broad path and you've got the, the, the narrow path. Why is it, if the gospel is so simple like that, and if it just is simple that we can find life through Jesus, why, why did the majority not take it? Now as a clarifying point, the few that he's talking about is relative. Because later on, he'll talk about the kingdom of God. He'll talk about how the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that starts out really small, but then it grows bigger and bigger and bigger. So obviously today we have millions and even potentially billions of believers, certainly in existence right now or, or passed on before us. So the kingdom of God is huge now, but relative to the size of the rest of the population, the majority seem to go to the broad path rather than go to the narrow path. Like why, why is that? I think it's, it's because human nature, certainly this is my, my nature, my tendency, is I want to self-rule. Like, I want to be king of my own heart. Like, I want to do what I want to do. <laughs> I want to do what I want, when I want, with who I want, for as long as I want. That's, that's what I want to do. But making Jesus Lord of our life is saying, you know what, I give that up. I make him king of my heart and life. You even look back at, at, at Genesis, back at the Garden of Eden, this is, this is what it was back then. That really is a beautiful story to help bring clarity as we look at the world today. Why are the things the way they are? When you look at that story, it brings into view and clarity of why things are the way they are. And so when you look at that story, they, had, they started out, they had such freedom, right? Before sin entered the world, Adam and Eve, they were chilling and they were naked. Like, you can't get any freer than that. Like, they're just walking around naked, <laughs> and not even, they didn't care. But then they had, then they, there was the, the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And I, I would almost imagine sometimes Adam and Eve would walk by that, that tree of knowledge of good and evil and be like, man, I just wonder what that's all about. I wonder what the knowledge of, true, uh, of, knowledge of good and evil is. But then they would have to say, you know what, though? I trust God with that. I trust God to define what good and evil is. I trust him with that, so I'm not going to take it. But then there came a point where the tempter tempted both of them, and they, they partook of it. And as soon as they did that, they said, God, I no longer trust you. I would like to define good and evil. I would like to manage my own life. I would like to have more freedom. But how many know that actually brought bondage? That actually brought slavery. And isn't that telling of what happens today? When we say, God, I don't want you to rule over my life, I'm going to define good and evil. I'm going to do my own thing, thinking that's going to bring freedom. All it does is it brings bondage, doesn't it? But whenever we turn to the Lord and we make him Lord of our life, it actually brings freedom. It actually brings forgiveness. It brings hope. I feel like I could be so free because I'm with God. I've got a relationship with him. And that, that's where the misunderstanding comes in. Christ came to bring, make us free, came to give us life. Man, if, if people only knew the freedom that exists in Jesus, if they only understood you're on the broad path and that is not leading to life, you think it's gonna lead to life, but actually leads to destruction. You need to go over to the narrow path. You need to go over to the small gate where Jesus is. No, it's not bondage. No, it's not legalism. You're gonna find freedom there when you make Jesus Lord of your life. That's where you find it. So Jesus makes this, this point. He says this in, in Luke chapter 9, verse 25. What is a prophet of man if he gains the whole world and he himself is destroyed or lost? You know, when we, we can run our own lives, we can even be successful. We can, we can build an empire. We can become wealthy, but miss out on the very thing that gives us life. And this is why this is so important, because literally this is life and death. I mean, Jesus is talking about destruction and life. Life is so good and destruction is so bad. So this is really important. This is a big deal. You know, um, have you guys ever asked yourself the question, like, how do people that don't have God in their life, like, how do they do it? You ever ask yourself that question? Like, how do, they, how do they do it? I mean, like, I know for me, I would be a mess without God. Come on, let's be honest. You would be a mess without God. 
Some of you with God are still kind of messy, okay? <laughs> You're still stumbling all over yourself and God picking you up. <laughs> I was watching this uh, uh, YouTube video of um, astronomy. I, I kind of like astronomy, stars, all that stuff. And there was something on the video that made me click on it. And I can't remember what it was, but um, I started watching the video. And the beginning of the video wasn't about what the video said. So, um, but I kept watching it and hoping that I would get to eventually that point. But the, the video started, just started with the Big Bang. You know, the very beginning of the universe started with the Big Bang. And it was funny because they were, they were talking about, um, you know, you had all this energy and then it expanded. Then you had plasma. And then, and then just so happened that the atoms, um, the protons started forming. And then just so happened, then this started happening. And just so happened, then this started happening. And I couldn't help but smile because I was like, man, I actually know the one that made all that stuff. Like, I actually talked to him this morning. <laughs> and, and he talked to me through his word. Like, I, I know and have relationship with him. And so they're going through this whole video and just like almost their mind is blown by all the, the cool stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it's really awesome. They're so infatuated with creation and they're missing the most important part, the creator, God Almighty. And I'm like, man, I've got relationship with him. That's what this is all about. Finding life is found in our creator and it's made possible because of what Jesus has done. He's the one that's the, the narrow way. He's the one that's the small gate. And he brings life to us because of what he's done. He allows us to come to the Father. He's the narrow gate. All right, the second one, the second point that I want to make. Lots of voices will try to call us away from the narrow gate. Lots of voices will try to call us away from the narrow gate. So let me just read this to you again. This is the middle part of the passages that we're covering. It's about... Um, false prophets. So it says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. But they, by their fruit, you will recognize them. People, do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit and every bad tree bears bad fruit. Good, good tree cannot bear bad fruit. A bad tree can't bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Now, what's really important is for us to remember who Jesus is talking to here. So these, if you go back to chapter 5 in Matthew, it says that his disciples came to him, and he, on the north shore of the, the Sea of Galilee, he begins to talk to them on this mount, this higher elevated area. He begins to preach to them. And so the, these are primarily followers of Jesus. Now, some of them are a variety of dedication of their following. You know, they may not be in the, they're not, the inner 12 wasn't formed yet, but they may not be in the inner 12 or soon to be in the inner 12, but they would be following at a distance. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't others, like Gentiles, you know, listening in, uh, so those that would be non-Jewish. It also, probably some religious leaders are, are listening in. So if we understand the context of what, what they would have understood false prophets to be, likely Jesus is talking about the Pharisees and Sadducees of the day. Now, Jesus didn't, if you read the, the Gospels, he didn't have a lot of great things to say about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, these religious leaders at the time that were very dedicated to uh, making up a bunch of rules, and they made following God all about these rules. Well, Jesus didn't have a whole lot of great things to say about them. Now, there were some, a few good ones. If you go to John chapter 3, there was Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was a good guy. There's a few others that were good guys in, in that bunch. But primarily, Jesus is addressing them and saying, these are the, the ones that are saying they're speaking on God's behalf, but you got to be careful. This group of people would eventually you know, not long from now, many of them be persecuted. Some of them would be imprisoned for their faith. Some of them would even die for their faith. And Jesus is wanting to warn them not only about that, but also about others, false prophets, who are saying that they're speaking on God's behalf, but indeed they are not. And while us probably today, you're not gonna be after church tempted to not follow Jesus because there's gonna be some Pharisee outside trying to persuade you otherwise. There's probably not gonna be some kind of Sadducee that's saying like, oh, don't, don't follow that Jesus guy. Even though that, that would be the case today, we still do have false voices that would discourage us from following Jesus. There's certainly plenty of false voices that would say, hey, no, go to the broad way. Go, it leads to life, but when it really doesn't. And Jesus would want to warn us of those things 
today. And I just, I mean, there's certainly lots of them that we could talk about, certainly lots of them that we could cover today, but I wanted just to hone in on just one, and that is, this is a, this is a lie. This is, a, this is something false, and here it is. Any Jesus will do. Any Jesus will do. I want to encourage you with this, that Jesus claimed to be God, and Jesus is God. He's not Satan's brother. He's not kind of some superhuman. He's not some fancy angel. Jesus, in fact, is God. He is 100% God. And there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You say, well, how can that be that? Isn't that three gods? Well, think about this. I'm just one person, okay? I'm Nathan, but I'm also, I'm a pastor, I'm a father, and I'm a husband. I'm 100% all three of those things, but I'm still the same person. So you have God functioning in different ways with his creation. You have God the Father, you have God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when we start to get away from this understanding that Jesus is indeed God, then we get, well, we have different versions of Christianity. That is no Christianity at all. And this is what Jesus is talking about. This is where we have to be careful. In fact, let me read you just a few verses. There's actually a lot of verses. I had to cut a lot of them out because just for the sake of time. But I would encourage you to look up all the verses where Jesus claimed to be God or the apostles understood Jesus as God. But I'm just going to cover three of them here. John chapter 1, verse 1. In fact, this was a part of our, um, our daily reading today in the one-year Bible. So John chapter 1, here it is. In the beginning was the Word... And the word was with God, and the word was God. Well, you say, you say, what is the word? I mean, you know, is that something, what is that? Well, he clarifies what that is later down in that same chapter. In John chapter 1, verse 14, he says, The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Of course, this is talking about Jesus. We have seen his glory in the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. This is talking about Jesus. If you could, you could imagine God speaking at the beginning of creation and his words were to come out and you were to put flesh on those words, that would be Jesus. So this is, this is Jesus coming from the Father to his creation. In fact, Jesus made this claim in John chapter 10, verse 30. I mean, this solves it all right here. This is what he says. I and the Father are one. There it is. I and the Father are one. Unless we think that, that he's just saying, oh, I and the Father are like good buddies. That's what he meant by one. They picked up, the religious leaders picked up stones to stone him. And they said, hey, we're going to stone you to death because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So Jesus claimed to be God. Now, here, this is why this is important. If he claimed to be God, but he isn't actually God, then why should we trust anything else he said? Now, let's flip that. Let's flip that, Okay. So let's, he claimed to be God, and we believe he is God. But if there's groups today, sects of, of Christianity, groups, cults of Christianity, that would say that Jesus isn't God, well, then that's a problem because he claimed to be God. So why should I trust anything else you say? See, this is all solved. If Jesus, Jesus never claimed to be God, <laughs> if he never claimed deity, well, then, I mean, we could all just speculate. Well, maybe he was a super angel. Maybe he, maybe he was God. Maybe he was just a really nice guy. You know, but since he claimed to be God, that's a problem if you say he's not God. So now I can't trust anything else is said. And this is important. You've got to make sure you've got the right Jesus. <laughs> because it undercuts the very ability to trust anything else he says. I can't just say, you know, you know what, he's not God, and then trust everything else he says. It's all either, you know, it's kind of the C.S. Lewis thing. He's either a liar, lunatic, or Lord. You know, since he claimed to be God, maybe, maybe he was a liar. He lied about it. Well, I don't think that's the, the case. I've experienced life change from him. Well, then he was, maybe he was a lunatic. lunatic. He, he didn't realize that he thought he was God. He legit thought he was God, but he was just a lunatic. Or you would have to say he's Lord. Again, all of this is there because he claimed to be God. That changes everything. And so for us, we've got to make sure that we've got the right Jesus. And Jesus is wanting to warn us about this. You're going to have people that are saying they're speaking on God's behalf. And if, unless they affirm this truth and many others that Jesus spoke, then don't trust what they're saying. That would include anybody that preaches the word of God. I would encourage you, get into the Bible. What I say, test it against the Bible. Go to the word of God. Search it out for yourself. You have, you've got a copy of it. That's why it's out there. So you can weigh these things that are said. Now, I think that sometimes that what can be a challenge is holding on to a truth 
that is, is in the Bible, like Jesus says he's God, but oh man, they're so, like this other group, they're so nice. They're so, and, and that's totally true. They might be, might be nice, and might, but they are wrong if you're going to believe what Jesus uh, said. But does it mean that we need to be unkind? In fact, I think we can be loving to other people that have different views than us. And, and I, I would say that the apex of love is where truth and grace come together. In fact, the verse that we just read from, from John chapter 1, verse 14, you know, we have seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son who came to us from the father, full of grace and truth. You know, if you went to a dinner party, you know, with, uh, with your spouse and um, at the beginning of the night, you notice that she's got, your, your wife's got a um, big old thing of seaweed just covering multiple teeth. Just, it's just covering multiple teeth and you don't say anything to her. And then she goes around and talks to all her friends and just has conversation all night. And then you get into the car, she pulls down the visor and she sees a big thing of seaweed, turns to you and says, did you know that I had this in my teeth? At that point, I would just lie. I would just have, I'll be honest with you. I just think at that point, no. <laughs> I was thinking about what I would do. No, you, you'd, you'd have to tell the truth at that point. And you say, yeah, I saw it in there. You know you'd be sleeping on the couch that night. You know, <laughs> you're gonna be on the couch. So for some of you, you're really good at this. You're really good at truth saying, okay? You're like overly good at truth saying. Some of you are thinking of your spouse right now. Yeah, he says the truth, like too much of the truth. You know, this is make me look fat. I mean, don't, it's another point. That's a pass, okay? You get a pass from God on that one. <laughs> Weigh it in scripture, people. Weigh it in scripture. <laughs> so, <laughs> where was I? See, this is where I get off track, people. Now, some of you are, are so truthful. You're so truthful, but you need to be more gracious. <laughs> you need to pull in that grace. Some of you, you're so gracious, and you're like, oh, yeah, everything's great. Everything's awesome. When it's not, <laughs> you need to tell the truth more often. So there's not this emotional avalanche that comes out later, right? So you need to be more truthful. All of us can grow in this. There's a way to be loving, and it's where it's at the apex of truth and grace. And that's with any of these issues. Maybe you're struggling, and, and you're like, man, I'm trying to hold on to the Bible and some of these, these things that the Bible says about you know, sexuality or marriage or gender and all, all that stuff. And I'm trying to, I'm having a hard time holding on to that stuff right there and also holding on to some of the things I, people I love and I care about. I would encourage you, go on a journey with that but also to know that you can express that. You can, you can have your opinion, and that's not hate to someone else just because you have your opinion. They might perceive it that way, but you know what we need to do? We just need to continue to love and care for, believe in, and point them to Jesus. He's the one that's got the answers. We don't have to sit there and argue with them and go back and forth and all that stuff. We can have our truth, what we know to believe to be true, the word of God, and then we can express love to them by serving and caring for them. But it's not hate to have your own opinion and to know the truth. As Jesus said, the truth will set you free. All right, this last point here. There are voices that point to the narrow gate. There are voices that point to the narrow gate. So there's some voices that point us away from the narrow gate. We need to be mindful of those. We need to think about those. We need to weigh them against Scripture. We need to be in fellowship with others that are headed towards God to guard and protect us. But this third point is there are voices that point to the narrow gate. I'm going to read it again to you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. And Jesus, again, is not beating around the bush here. He's being very, very clear. And the, the point that we've got to take away from this is you can preach powerful sermons, you can perform amazing miracles, all those things, the things that you would think would get you into heaven. Like, you know, like, oh man, yeah, for sure he's going to heaven because he preached amazing messages. He, he did all these healings. And Jesus says, no, no, no. Even if it's those things, those things don't save you. In fact, he would, he would say, it's not about what you do. It's about who you know, because that's what he clarifies later on in the verse. He says, he, he says to the ones that, that did all those things, 
He said, depart from me, I never knew you. In other, in other words, there needed to be relationship with him. In fact, if you go to John chapter 6, verse 29, this is the one thing, the one work that God wants you to do. This is what Jesus says. This is the only work, okay, that's kind of in quotes, only work God wants from us. Here it is. Believe in the one he has sent. To believe in Jesus. Now, all the other things, should you give money? Should you, should you uh, do good for others? Should you preach? Should you, you know, worship? should you use your gifts for the Lord? Absolutely. But none of those things save us. None of those things get us through the gate. The gate is Jesus, and it's about who you know. It's about having relationship with him. And the question, the challenge, I think, for all of us, including myself, is to ask the question, do we know him? Do you actually have relationship with him? The question isn't how many sermons have I preached? How many services have I attended? How much money have I given? That's not the question. The question is, do I know Jesus? And the same is true for you. It's not how, how often do you attend church? Not how, did you go to the men's conference? All those things are great and they're wonderful, but it's about who you know. It's about knowing Jesus. I wouldn't want, and Jesus wouldn't want, on that day when you stood before him, for you to recount all the great things you thought you did for Jesus, only to find out him say to you, I never actually knew you. Man, sobering. I told you, this, this message is challenging, including to myself. And my heart would never be to scare someone out of their salvation. That's not what this is about. But Paul, the apostle to the church of Corinth, actually challenges us with the same thing. He says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. Paul is saying that to Christians. He's saying, take a moment and examine yourself. Do you have a real active faith? Do you have one that's transformed your life? Not because of something you, some habit you started doing, like something good you started doing. No, it's because of who you met. Is it who you started a relationship with? I know for me, when I was, I was 14, I was introduced to a relationship with Jesus. I didn't really have much of a context of Christianity. I didn't really attend much when I was growing up. But man, I met Jesus and it changed everything. I didn't know the rules. I didn't understand all the do's and don'ts. I didn't understand any of that. What I did know was I knew this new guy, Jesus, and he transformed my heart and my life. And that's the question that God would pose to all of us today. Do you know his son, Jesus? And if you don't, you can. You can put your faith in him. You can make him Lord of your life. Let's take a moment. Let's all pray. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Before I pray, I do want to take just a second here to offer an invitation, an opportunity for, for anyone here that if you ask yourself that question, had an honest assessment, you might be able to identify some good things that you've done Maybe you can identify some things you've done for the church or done for other people. But if you're being honest with yourself, you don't have a, a transforming relationship with Jesus. I'm here to encourage you today. You can have that. At one moment, I did that in my life. And many here have done the same, where they put their faith and their trust in Jesus. They made him Lord of their life. Said, no longer my way. I'm going Jesus's way. I'm headed to the narrow path, to the small gate. I'm headed to life. And can I just tell you, he will transform your life like never before. He's going to do great things in and through you. But that's all to come. But first, you've got to start your relationship with him. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to give you that opportunity. If you're here today and you want to say, yes, I want to start a relationship with Jesus, or maybe you've been away from him for a while, you say, yeah, today I want to renew my relationship with Jesus. Would you just slip up your hand? I want an opportunity to pray for you today. Just slip it up. Yeah, that's awesome over here. Yeah, over here. That's great. Right, I see it right there. Slip up your hand. I just want an opportunity to pray for you. Yeah, right there. So cool. Anybody else? Yeah, back there, over there. So cool. See the hands. Yeah, back there, that's so cool. I, I want you to take a moment right now, for those that raised your hand, I want you to take a moment and say a prayer in your heart of dedication to the Lord, that you make him Lord of your life. Just pray that he would forgive you of your sins and that you put your faith and your trust in him. Make him Lord of your life and that you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. 
Today, you're going to become a child of God. All of us, let's pray together. Lord, we just love you and we thank you for every person that raised their hand in this place, that's putting their faith and hope in you. God, I pray that you would bless them, that you would encourage them. And God, as they start this journey with you, this relationship with you, God, that you would do supernatural things, that God, you would move powerfully. And so, Father, I pray that you would work in their hearts. And for the rest of us, Lord, may we continue to be on fire for you, in love with you, passionate for you, knowing that it's all about a relationship with you. And so, Father, I pray that you would have your way in our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your goodness. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? So I'm going to have the, the prayer team, if you could go ahead and come forward. We're going to pray for those that maybe you've got a need uh, today. It could be something physical. It could be something financial, emotional, whatever it might be. We want the opportunity to pray for you. Certainly, if you gave your life to Jesus, we'd love the opportunity to pray for you, believe that God's going to do great things in your heart and life. But for the rest of us, could we just take a moment? This song is uh, Hallelujah for the Cross. Just take a moment to, to say, thank you, Jesus, for the cross. It's not because of anything good I've done. It's not because I'm so great, but it's because of what he's done now that I have the opportunity to know Jesus. So come on, all over this place, would you lift your hands right now and just say thanks to Jesus. In your own words, begin to communicate that and tell him thank you. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. And Lord, we give you worship and praise in this place. God, we love you in Jesus' name. Come on, let's worship together.